All right, Tristan, we're back for the second half of the episode. Thank you so much for joining me. We're going to uh, continue our conversation. Awesome. Look forward to it. I think that you could achieve this kind of change without needing as much height. Um, so let's run through the list really quick. So one is investing in, we call it one great block. So create a nucleus of high quality development of public destinations to kickstart growth. So that's what Surrey did. And I think that's brilliant. Two, transform the local streets and add new streets that are completely pedestrian friendly. Really prioritize pedestrians in this one place, at least. One lane in both directions, potentially bump outs at intersections, designed to be slow. You know, people shouldn't be driving faster than, say, 35 kilometers an hour. That uh, there's on-street parking, actually, and that people are actually using to create a buffer between people in the street. Yeah, those those are the key things. So let's let's stick with that design for a second and and really kind of understand it. So if the, if I were to to look at that from like a European context, I would lower that speed to thirty kilometers per hour. I don't know why I added the extra five. Sure, thirty is. <laughs> you, you crazy Canadians, I tell <laughs> you, you know. But there's a mad there's a magic to that, right? Of yes. of thirty kilometers per hour, because now we're we're talking about you know for for those of us on the imperial system, that's seventeen miles per hour. Now we're starting to get into non-lethal speeds yeah. because as we start to creep up, then it just goes insane in terms of the, the number of fatalities that would happen if there's any sort of interaction between a person walking or a person on a bike. But the beauty of 30 kilometers per hour is the default speed for shared spaces in the European context when a person on a bike and a person driving are going to share that space. If it's a pedestrian priority zone, which which is a true shared concept, they'll bring that speed down to more like 15 kilometers per hour yeah. of it be truly pedestrian priority. So that's all. the only reason I wanted to clarify whether you were thinking like closer to the, the, the 30 kilometer per hour, the feet strut sort of speed, or the 15 kilometer per hour, meaning pedestrian like prioritized like, street. Yeah. Yeah. Not just prioritized, but actually shared space where walk, people walking and driving. Exactly. Around the same and, space. And, yeah. and maybe no curbs because it may not. No even, curbs it, at that point. Yeah. It's exactly, a totally different yeah. design concept. So all of those would be appropriate. So there's different ways to achieve like a, a truly pedestrian friendly place. But the test is, will people allow their children to walk across the street on their own? If you fail to do that, then you haven't created a, a human-friendly place. Yeah. Right. And 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 uh, slower cars make less noise, so um, there's that they create less stress for people near them. It's just in, on many dimensions, it's just critical for creating that environment that that feels like a destination, like a wonderful place to stop and spend time. So. Creating yeah, that first list, nucleus I, I, of I development. Distracted yeah. you. <laughs> Improving those streets, adding new streets so you have small blocks and great connectivity. Um, one thing Surrey did that I think is brilliant is, so this is number three, create tax incentives to develop, but with a hard deadline. So we all hate tax incentives. We want to create a city where development is intrinsically um, worth building. But... If you create a hard deadline, then you're giving people a reason to invest now, not later, which breaks open that dam and gets that self-reinforcing development going, which is the goal here, right? So create like a really strong financial incentive and reward those people who make the first few risky bets in those first, say, three to four years, um, because you need to get those first developments going. So why not use financial incentives? Number four. So walkable environments and car dependent environments undermine each other. Right. So if you want a successful walkable environment, you need to visibly hide the car dependent environment. You All those existing parking lots and big roads, if you haven't fixed them all, uh, you need to hide them somehow. So create hedges, fences, placemaking, artwork, anything to hide them. Six, kiosks. So it, it, instead of waiting for developers to create those first commercial places on the street, those first destinations, uh, make really, really low cost places where people can set up shops or, or um, kiosks and, and um, uh, restaurant trucks. What, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, food trucks. Food trucks. Thank you. Yeah. So all these things create those destinations without having to wait for development to happen. Eight or wherever I am on the list, uh, land value tax. So make it expensive for people to not develop their land. So I won't get into the technical 
details on how a land value tax works. Right now, I don't think it's necessary, but the key point is to set up your tax system. So if someone's sitting on top of really low value land next to a transit station, it's going to cost them money. You know, they're going to have to pay taxes as if they had developed it, which encourages them to, to make that development. So let's say that we do all of that and maybe one or two other things. Then now we're really making it so that the thing that makes sense to do, people have confidence that if they build, say, a six-story pedestrian-friendly building with commerce on the ground floor, it's going to work because we've done everything to create a fertile environment for that to succeed. And you can allow that low, lower height. I'd like to, this is maybe a good moment to respond to that issue of, you know, uh, people at Strong Towns and elsewhere argue that, you know, we should be making small incremental investments. And here I am arguing for this sudden major investment. And I really do think that the two points of view are compatible because the way I think about it is that you need to intervene to create that hospitable environment for the kind of pedestrian friendly growth we want. And then once you establish the basics, then it can start to reinforce itself on its own. And you don't have to make these kind of risky major public investments. But it does require that initial investment because, I mean, if you, there's actually studies where they've done streetscape enhancements in totally car dependent environments. Or if we, you know, there was that photo of the, um, the bricks and the sidewalk, you know, bricks on a sidewalk in a walkable place might actually help make it a convivial place where people want to spend time. But in an environment where you have a car body shop on one side and a wide road on the other and crabgrass and broken parking, it, it accomplishes nothing. It actually accomplishes nothing. And those, that's what the studies show. The, these these small-scale investments don't change anything. I would even go so far as to say that it not only does it accomplish nothing, it actually very quickly degenerates into being an unwalkable environment and, you know, and makes it very difficult for a person in a wheelchair to navigate it because right. they're not maintaining it. You know, yeah, it's because they're not maintaining it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this image here for Surrey, this is a proposed development, uh, folks, and it's like really high class, futuristic, uh, beautiful, uh, big towers are really tall towers, though, though narrow. So that so they reduce the sun impact on the street uh, shadow impact. But, you know, lots of awnings, lots of features to create a, a, a people-friendly place and lots of people on the street. And I don't think that that's a lie here. So I do think that if they build this, there will be people there. Yeah. So this reminds me a lot of Vancouver. Yeah. Okay. How far away is Surrey from Vancouver? Well, uh, uh, about 40 minutes on the, on the train. Okay. So on it's about 40 transit. minutes on the train. So in other words, this is like a a legitimate, because of high cost of housing in Vancouver, you know, Surrey is suddenly envisioning itself as being, I mean, I look at, if somebody looks at this and says, you know, what you're talking about is trying to Manhattanize our, you know, little town, you know, our, our, our community that we have, this seems like this is trying to Vancouverize. Surrey because it's it's starting to look and feel like a real city, you know, with towers and and all this environment. This is kind of hard for a lot of people in suburban context, single family home communities to to swallow at times. And I, I really caution us for for going, making that jump from single family home community with strip malls to mega towers. I really don't know that that's necessarily the easiest sell. You had talked about just a moment ago that you didn't see the two things, you know, incompatible going big and, and this incremental uh, approach to it. Either way, the thing that's not being mentioned that has to take place first is we need to be able to legalize doing something other than car dependent suburban yeah. sprawl development. That's so right. the That's first right. thing that has to happen is we have to make it legal to do something other than that. Yeah, yeah. So well taken point. Um, I, if if our only model for creating walkable suburbia is to turn it all into downtown, then it's a political non-starter. Right. In the Surrey context, it works. So, you know, uh, the mayor who got that stuff going, she had a 72 approval, 72% approval rating. Very, very popular project. Extremely popular. Um, because it's just like 
center to like a city region, you know, it makes sense to actually have a downtown there. And it will, this new downtown will be more at the center of the wider region than Vancouver is. Vancouver's up at the edge on the water, right? This will be really in the center of the urban region. So it makes sense there. Um, but no, but your point is well taken. Actually, if you want to go back to that photo in the, um, the main directory of the Eastern Passage Project. So this was a development that was approved a few weeks ago. This is in a, on a transit corridor in a longtime suburban community of Halifax, my home city. Okay, and right. instead of proposing massive towers that would have gone over like uh, you know poorly, um, we were proposing you know townhouses in the middle, a four-story apartment building in front next to transit with a few shops on the ground floor, some stacked townhouses near transit, in the back a few single-family homes to meet some of the planning requirements next to a school next to a regional park. The the developer is spending their own money to create a public square in the center of this development because they they believe in it. This project, yes, it was a little bit controversial. There was five people who showed up at the public hearing to express great opposition to this. But five is not that many. I've seen hearings with dozens of people, right? And so this is pedestrian-friendly, walkable, transit-oriented growth, all, all the buzzwords. And it's appropriate for a suburban context. This is something politically people are willing to accept. And I do think that not just politically, but ethically, we should be building this kind of development at much larger scale because it is very human friendly, this like low rise street oriented buildings where where you you know you can let your kids play in the backyard or go to the public square and 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 they're safe. You know, it's it's like a, it's a good human centric design. And also because that people have different preferences. And when we design cities, we need to have a uh, multiplicity of contexts that respond to those different preferences. So some people like the vibrancy of a downtown. Some people love that energy. Other people really prefer to have a place that's quieter and they don't need to be able to do as much during the day. But hey, you know, they really would like to have a local pizza shop or a cafe, you know. And so this kind of development aims to address that demand that for so long suburbs have car dependent suburbs have been meeting. Um, but it really does a better job meeting it because um, you have almost the same level of density on the street. Like houses in a lot of suburbs are really packed closely together, but the street network is more efficient and we have just a little bit of commerce so that people can actually walk to things they need. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll point out in the, in the, uh, the, you know, sort of the diagram, the visioning uh, the rendering, project, yeah. the rendering that we have here. Uh, yeah, we see that we, we've got some nice uh, density that's happening here. We also see um, the treatment of people riding bikes as, okay, yes, they're going to just occupy the street. Yeah. And so, and I have no problem with that as long as we stop doing what is happening here in this photo, which is treating the street no differently than we treat the street, you know, when we, you know, are, are prioritizing automobiles. And so going back to get your design right of your street in these in these rich environments that communicate to the driver that you're no longer in driver priority space you are in people priority space and it makes sense makes sense intuitively that this is a 30 kilometer per hour zone if it's not a 30 kilometer per hour zone then we got to bite the bullet and and put in protected and separated infrastructure because it's not all ages and abilities. The only That's way right. that this works is all ages and abilities is if that auto infrastructure is, is tweaked to the point where it's no longer auto infrastructure, it's people oriented infrastructure. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and we, it's hard to, to represent that in these renderings, but it, it's, it's, well, no, it, it's absolutely. I mean, this imperative. is an accurate yeah. rendering of, of the street as it's currently conceived. And so we, uh, the, the city's developing new street standards and we went to the absolute maximum that was possible in that standards to narrow that street so that if there is on street parking on both sides, it actually will slow traffic enough that uh, people can feel comfortable walking and biking there. Now, I might be getting a detail wrong there. Could you um, cut that out? Because I, I, I would have to go back and check. 
believe that we might have decided not to use on-street parking because we um, were afraid that people wouldn't use it. And what often happens is you end up with a street that was supposed to be narrow, Too wide, but ends yeah. up being really wide. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think so, we keep that in there because that's a good reflection to that brings up the point that, um, yes, and, and, and Jeff Speck talks about this a little bit in his book, Walkable City, is you can use on-street parking as a, a traffic calming mechanism because it creates more friction on the street. Yeah. But if people aren't parking there, then suddenly you've got a, a wide tarmac. And what do you get yeah. when you have a wide tarmac? You can land yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. And that's where going back to the actual physical elements of what makes up the street is absolutely a, an imperative is that if this is truly a 30 kilometer per hour zone, maybe it's not asphalt. Maybe it's not a tarmac, yeah, you know, maybe yeah. you're, you're actually putting in uh, materials or you're, you know, you're, you're looking at the design of it so that if there is separate space for pedestrians versus people driving and people riding bikes, maybe that space that's, that's people driving and riding bikes, if it's asphalt, maybe it's red colored asphalt like mm -hmm. the Dutch do to, to send it, you know, to really send a clear message to drivers. You're no longer in driver priority space. You're now in a place where you need to you're the guest in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that we could do and we could still potentially do this that would, I think, make a big help is make that crosswalk raised, for example. Now, oh, yeah. Yeah. This street is as narrow as we can make it, and it is a cul-de-sac. So at the end of this street, we don't have it in this diagram, but uh, the the engineers we work with who are great uh, helped us with this awesome idea where we have a green median in the center. So instead of a big pavement cul-de-sac, you have a green median with a very narrow lane that people drive around. Mm -hmm. So it really communicates that this is slow speed you know, local, you know, just people getting in their driveways, but it's going to be a very safe place to walk and bike. Now, you know, with projects like this, you always have to decide, like, how far do you want to push things with this project? I would, I think it would be totally appropriate to go win earth on this, to, to have a completely shared street. Like we were talking about 15 kilometers an hour. No one is driving far here, right? Right, right. Yeah. Now, I mean, this is like, it's, it's frustrating to me that it's difficult to implement stuff like that when it's been shown to work around the world. It's considered normal to build these huge roads that kill people. And it's considered radical to build, you know, slow, people-centered, shared streets. Now you're channeling this conversation towards uh, south of the border here. So uh, <laughs> you know, building streets that are going to kill people. So so this is Tyson. So let's let's go down into we're, let's talk America here now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So Tyson's is this hilarious example. Just so everything we were talking about earlier about being willing to make sacrifices and recognize that if you're going to design for walkability, you're not designing for cars. You're not designing for high speed traffic, I should say. You, you can still design for local car travel and, and cars play a very well, important oh, so, role. So let's talk a places. little bit about that. Let's talk about the difference between places being accessible versus places that welcome a, a mobility mode. And so we have universal accessibility of being able to drive a car everywhere, you know, in, in every place, you know, and in, in oftentimes if when they look like this, it's mm -hmm. it's also places that encourage and welcome high speed travel. Um, yeah. So a, a, you know, an environment that is accessible for people walking and biking uh, may not welcome people walking and biking. And so there's mm -hmm. a difference between that accessibility yeah, yeah. and what's a, a, an inviting and welcoming environment. So for yeah. the, the listening audience, we're now looking at a, a, a massive, massive road here. Uh, it looks like it's Virginia State Route 123. That's it's right, yeah. Eight lanes plus a turn lane. So that we're looking at a nine lane monster. Uh, that would mean that this is a state highway, but I also see lots of driveway cuts. So technically it's also a strode, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, um, the, so Tyson's, so Tyson's is this massive suburban redevelopment, probably the biggest one in the world. And it's attracted enormous amount of mixed use development. So it's really been a success in a lot of ways because it's close to the, 
airport and close to Washington, D.C. and close to the Pentagon. So there's lots of people who want to live and work in this area, lots of potential. And they'd run out of space to build on. But they weren't willing to sacrifice this network of strodes throughout their community. So, you know, really, really wide in many places, like eight lanes or more. And in fact, in many places, directly next to transit, they they widened it. So they widened some from like eight to 10 or 11 lanes. And you that's know, a transit directly. stop right here in the photo, right? Yeah, that's a transit stop right there. And um, they actually did remove one lane in this place on the left. So there's two um, slip lanes, two lanes that that went through that slip lane. The slip lane shouldn't exist in a walkable place at all. And it Period. should never be yeah. eight lanes. But Full this, stop. <laughs> yeah, it went from nine lanes down to eight. And I'm sorry, that's not far enough. <laughs> you know, you're not creating a truly walkable place. And so there's all this developable land next to that transit station that, that hasn't been moving yet. And I really do think that contributing to that is that they haven't been willing to make these, uh, what politically at least are, are seen as sacrifices and to really say, you know, if we want this to succeed, we need to make this people friendly. And the, the people, the local community that was advocating for widening these roads while also advocating for high density transit oriented growth, they didn't, they thought that you need wide roads to protect the economy that was going to economically collapse if you didn't allow people to drive and and fair you know that they, they these are people who spend their entire lives driving to do everything and it's very hard for people in that context to imagine that you could have an economic system that relies on a majority of people walking biking and taking transit to places it's just a like far out concept for people who drive for nearly everything and so people who believed in this project, who supported it, were actually advocating for widening roads while um, building, you know, uh, tall towers and mixed-use development. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is not even an arterial. This is a collector. And it's, uh, so this is uh, Tyson's Boulevard, I believe. And it's eight lanes wide. Am I counting that correctly? Yeah, eight lanes. Uh, it gets wider in places. Of course, there's been deaths there, you know. This is um, a minor collector. This is four lanes wide in one direction. It's just everything is just at such a scale. So I want to emphasize something you just said a moment ago. So you said there's a difference between making a, a place technically accessible for people walking or biking, like in theory, people can do it, and achieving true excellence. And I think that the professions of engineering and urban design and, and urban planning are nowhere near where they need to be on recognizing that to achieve excellence and walkability, walkability means something and we're failing it over and over and over again. That It doesn't mean removing one slip lane and leaving an eight lane road. <laughs> it means truly bringing these streets down to size, adding more streets to get more cars through elsewhere but making sure that the entire path that somebody walks somewhere, they have a truly high quality environment for the whole way. It is a difficult task. We need to recognize that this is a hard thing to do. And it's going to take a lot of work well, over in, in a lot some of time. Way, in some ways, it is a hard thing to do, Tristan. I, I jump in and, and say that, yes, in some ways, this is a hard thing to do. Political will and the lack of really true imagination as to, to what we would need to do. It's actually quite simple what has to happen to this environment. This the environment, this street has to be basically completely redesigned and thrown out and blown up. To your point, what do we have there? That yeah. is a bike, bike share, share station. Yeah, it, It's like, yeah, this is a dare. This isn't creating, you know, I call them activity assets. When you create a safe and inviting environment that encourages people to walk and bike to places, the safe and inviting part is the key thing. It's creating a welcoming environment. It's creating a welcome, welcoming habitat that encourages natural human activity to be able to walk and bike to meet your daily needs. Not talking about exercise here. I'm talking about being able to do that. This particular environment, you know, really would have to be completely transformed. And, you know, hey, let's while we're at it, let's uh, let's bring some greenery back in here. Let's have some street yeah. trees. Let's create a, an environment. I mean, and, and theoretically, the walls of those buildings. Right. Because yes, the, exactly. Back to so I was just going to say that I says theoretically, theoretically, it's possible to walk here. Theoretically, right. it's possible, yeah. but it's not welcoming these blank walls and, and, and everything that you see here. So really, 
this, and I'm glad, and I, I really wanted to focus in on Tyson's because you said a few magic words. It's very close to Washington, D.C. It's, it's one of these environments, you know, similar to like with Surrey, you know, that's there to try to provide alternatives to people who are completely priced out of Vancouver. You know, Tyson's has, it had been envisioned as being a place that could be a legitimate alternative, you know, to the, the, the Metro DC area there probably is technically part of the Metro DC area, but it's just this auto sewer hell that has been created with plenty of density all around it. But again, it's not walkable and it's certainly not bikeable. Yeah. Go to the next image. So here on the right, you see some of the, the, the funny bike lanes and there's some worse bike lanes too. There's, there's bike lanes that are going in the middle of the road with a turning lane on the right and more lanes on the left. And, well, and uh, I'm glad you included, and glad you included this particular image. And for the listening audience, uh, this is an image of the Fairfax County master uh, bicycle master plan uh, dated October, 2014. And uh, Fairfax County is the county uh, where Tyson's uh, is, is located there in Virginia. The image that they chose to use is what we would typically kind of conceive of when we think of what a cyclist is. They're on, you know, sort of road bikes with skinny tires. They're wearing high-vis high clothing, the guy in the front is, and they're wearing helmets. This is not the image that, that I'm trying to promote. This is not the, and, the and idea of... men. Yeah. Which is important because um, uh, exactly <laughs> the, the evidence does show that so only roughly one percent of people will be able to bike would be willing to bike in this context with that kind of danger in high speed roads and the most roughly, likely if are if that yes if that yes. if that exactly if that yes the most likely the people who are most um, willing to do this are often middle aged men. Um, I don't know why that's true, but it appears to be true anyway. It's a, so, it's a trope. It's a stereotype, a typical trope. Um, I'm a middle-aged man and I also have a racing bike and I wear Lyco when, when I'm on my, my yeah, racing bike. Yeah. So I am the mammal, the middle, right, middle-aged right. man in Lycra. <laughs> really what we're, what it's, it, it's, it's referring to is that we're talking about sports and recreation cycling, which is much different than exactly. the ability to just want to get down to the grocery store. Yeah. And the grocery store is a little bit farther than walking distance. It may not be served by transit. It's just, it's practical and pragmatic to get on your bike and go and do that trip and get back when you have a community that has a network of safe and inviting active mobility systems. And for that to work, um, you can't have to put on high-vis clothing or even a helmet. It, it needs to be so safe and comfortable that anyone could just drop on their bike and, and head down the street. And so now what's what's frustrating is that the people who are willing to bike in this kind of environment, they are often the only people biking because everyone else has been weeded out. And so they become the voices of the bicycling community. And um, so in this case- in the, pa- in the past, that was pretty much the only voices. Fortunately, now we're starting to see that change because we're so seeing Tyson's the momentum. Has seen Yes, Tyson's has seen that change. So the reason why the bicycle master plan, you know, said all we needed is painted bike lanes, and it was actually fine to not have bike lanes for downhills. And this is actually in the plan, so it's okay to have no bike lanes downhill because cyclists will be going so fast downhill that they'll be matching the speed of cars. So you don't need to separate them. I mean, you can can't make that up. But it was because the local cycling advocates were people who are willing to bike in that kind of environment. And as well, they and, become and, more and, diverse, and, and let's be let's be clear of the context of this situation. So this is 2014. So they had been working on this bicycle master plan in the years leading up to 2014. Um, you know, this is basically a decade ago. So the the you know a decade ago and 15 years ago and 20 years ago the majority of the people who were actually advocating for any kind of bicycle infrastructure were at that point in time mostly the vehicular cyclist um genre of of bicycle advocates and uh 
and all they cared about was a, a shoulder. You know, they, 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 re, if that, and, uh, and so. So for people who haven't heard that term before, vehicular cyclists are people who believe that we should treat bikes as if they're small cars. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a funny point of view. I mean, it yeah, ends if, up- if, yeah, if, if you really want to dive into that deep rabbit hole, just Google it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a good idea. Let's just say it's idea. it's not designing cities for everybody. It's designing them for a very small proportion of people. Yeah, um, yeah. So let's wrap up Tyson's here, and and, and well, you've got a couple of images on screen. Walk, walk us through what your intent is on on these two side by side images, and and describe yeah, them so, for our listening audience too. So this is the Boro. This is one of the new developments in the area. So as I mentioned, they were successful in attracting a lot of mixed use development despite their huge roads. Um, but there's a lot of exceptions, right? Uh, there's, um, so on this one street on the left, you have this um, narrow street, very nicely designed street with on-street parking, outdoor cafes, uh, local shops, very tall building, but you know a high quality street. On the other side of the same building, you have just a massive blank wall. And so what they've done in Tyson's is that with the streets, you have, you know, streets internal to blocks that are pedestrian friendly. And then between those pockets of pedestrian friendly buildings and streets, you have these massive roads and blank walls. So a lot of people describe it as islands of walkability with these like rivers of uh, cars and, and unfriendly environments around them. And um, what this misses is that humans, <laughs> they need to feel comfortable for the entire walk to where they're going. And for these buildings and businesses to reinforce each other's success, by that logic that we were discussing earlier, where street life and businesses and homes all make each other more successful and create that vibrancy that, that is the basic requirement of a successful walkable place, that can't happen if you were de- severing these communities from each other with blank walls and wide roads. So I really liked what you were saying that, you know, in a sense, this is easy. In a sense, uh, we know what it means to design a pedestrian friendly street and what it means to design a people oriented building. But what it requires is consistency and rigor, because if you create one massive blank wall in one section of street or create one intersection that has this like fast slip lane that no one feels comfortable crossing, then you are cutting off parts of the community from each other. Yeah. Um, and that is what I think is missing from the professions, the, the urban design professions right now, engineering, planning, the whole bit, is the lack of rigor in understanding what it truly means to build walkable places and, and the level of consistency we're going to have to achieve. Yeah. And here's a, a, another rendering here. And uh this is the mile also on Tyson's great development. Yeah. And again, you know, when I look at these, these types of, of, of designs and uh, design elements, one of the things that I, I start to think about is, yeah, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff that's happening here. I love the fact that we have the number of street trees that we have. I'm assuming the, the motor vehicles that are there, those are parked. Is that correct? Is that a parking area? I'm not sure. I, I, yeah. I suspect that's on street parking, but it's, it's unclear. I mean, it's just a rendering. So I yeah, it's so. a rendering. Um, but one of the things that, that I think about when I see these types of designs and, and is a complete disconnect with the functionality of riding a bike in this environment. And and what I mean by this is if this were, if this same rendering was of a, a Danish city or a Dutch city and you saw those distances, you'd see right away that those distances, as you were talking about earlier, the first hundred meters are so incredibly important and 800 meters is the farthest that somebody's going to be able to want to walk. I look at this and say, okay, where's your bike lanes? Where's your bicycle priority mobility lanes? Because the other thing that we have to do when we change our brain, our car centric North American brain, is we have to stop thinking about um, the who rides a bike from this to who's going to use a, a, a bike oriented 
facility and change that around to, oh, well, yeah, that's going to be somebody who's in a wheelchair. That's going to be somebody who's in an adaptive cycle. That's going to be the little old lady who she rides her bike, her step through Alma Feet's bike, because, you know, she can't walk that far, but she can certainly ride her bike that far. Right. In other words, that is a whole change in our mindset of who actually will ride a, a bike, uh, a cargo bike with three yeah. kids on it. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and so that's one of the things that I really see us struggling with in North America is is not designing things. You know, if I were to overlay and I'll do that in the in the I'll overlay the image of. Carmel, Indiana, and Monon Boulevard, where you have similar types of heights of buildings, but the but you have you know a, a wonderful facility for people who are rolling through, and a separate facility for people who are strolling through, and then you also have uh, one lane of traffic in each direction for people driving through, yeah. and so it's not and anti-car. That would be very easy to achieve in this context, oh. you know. Look this. Yeah. I mean, you have so much space. You're, you're basically, yeah, yeah. Sur- unless this center lane right here is intended to be use. a multi-use yeah. path. Okay, fine. But given the amount of distances that clearly these buildings are theoretically in the distance, yeah, you got plenty of space. Why not? Why not make it? And if you're saying, well, you know, we want to make it as eco-friendly as possible. We don't want to give up green space. Fine. Use some pavers. You use some filtration so that you're you, you're decreasing the amount of impervious cover that you have. Yeah, yeah, for so. sure. Um, the world is, I, I think is your read, oyster. I, I can't remember the proportion, <laughs> but um, yeah. I believe a majority of families actually have bikes in their homes, right? So when we think about well, who's going to bike? I mean, if you create that context where it's easy and and useful for everyone, then they will. Um, I'd love to talk about um, one of the the critical issues here, which is coming back to what you can see. So um, I'd love to grab an example from both Uptown Core and Downtown Kendall. So let's take the Uptown Core example first. Sure. Okay. So this is, uh, this is Uptown Core. That's right. That's right. So um, this is their new main street. Like the other spots, we can critique issues with it. I mean, one thing is that the engineering department required that the street be a highway bypass. And so that's why it's five lanes wide. And it's just, you know, we should be in a place where we know that if we're building a walkable community, no, it cannot be a highway bypass for the main street. That's just off the table. Um, but it's like, it's, no, yeah. It's yeah, hard yeah. stop. And no. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. And the buildings aren't perfect, but like this is, you know, a commendable effort and um, they're starting to get some shops in the ground floors. Now, the thing is, though, that uh, if you go to the next image, they only built out that one block of main street with buildings on both sides. And then beyond that, you get the old parking lots and the Walmart that's there and the blank walls. And so it's been hard to attract more investment in consistently building out this main street because so much of the main street uh, and attracting businesses to the main street, because so much of it is just totally undermined by this. Basically, it's like it's like a wounded animal. It's like you've you've cut off the bottom half of the animal and it loses its blood. Sorry for the violent analogy, but like you, by cutting Contrasting. off the main street and having no enclosure, <laughs> you're like, it just loses its energy. It just, you know, uh, spills out. And so to create a successful main street, you need to invest enough in those first buildings or use placemaking to hide that view to create a contained sense of space for the entire way that people are walking. Because if you only have one block that is contained on both sides, then you don't, it's hard to achieve that critical mass of people walking to create that kind of main street where people are willing to open businesses and where developers are willing to invest more. So this is a map of it. So um, since the nineties, you only have had a limited amount of mixed use buildings built, whereas there's a map of the big box stores that have been built. And there are many, many more big box stores have been built in this area that was supposed to become a a walkable downtown. And they're still hoping to flip those big box stores back into walkable downtown, but it's going to take many years. And I think that they slowed down the process by failing to visually contain the main street. Yeah. Where is this located? 
I'm sorry, this is the Uptown Core in Oakville, Ontario. So Oakville is a suburb kind of of Toronto. It's in the uh, Toronto region. And it has a historic walkable Main Street, but this is like the deep into the suburban section of the city. Got it. And it is starting to attract a few like larger pedestrian friendly buildings now, but uh, the, the failure to enclose that street really slowed down the process. I think that what you had said earlier is very, very important for us to focus in. I'm, I'm zooming in on this image just a little bit so we can get the mixed use and the, uh, the the big box store the yellow in the yellow here. And you can see that they're sort of drowning in their sea of parking um, around each of the, the yellow buildings there. Is what you said about going big. And uh, the example that I just used uh, by bringing up uh, Carmel, Indiana, is an example of that. And the way that they were able to transform and build a downtown environment where they had none, really. Uh, They had one little tiny Main Street uh, uh, area uh, that was, quote unquote, their historic downtown area. But other than that, it was a really small city, the Monon rail line went through and had a, 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 a station there at basically Main Street. But when, you know, the, the rail went away and then that became the Monon rail trail that went through there and goes 35 miles, you know, uh, stretching from Indianapolis uh, to the north, to the communities to the north. But the what they did was they said, we're going to go big. And so the city itself became the developer in the sense of of buying up all of these properties, you know, that would have been, you know, analogous to everything, you know, to the, the, the upper end of this image and really started to say, OK, this is our vision. We want to be make this walkable. We want to make this bikeable since it's on the Monon Trail it's inherently bikeable all the way up to all of our communities that are along the trail uh, because it is a rail trail, including stretching all the way 15 miles to the um, to the south to Indianapolis, downtown Indianapolis. And so, you know, they really had that bold vision of doing it and being the developer so that they could control it and not allow this kind of stuff to happen because because guess what? They already had that shit. Right, you right. Know, it exists in their suburbs because they are primarily, they became, they were a suburban sprawl development with no heart, no soul, no downtown. And so Mayor Brainerd was like, we need to build this. And so there's a lot about uh, uh, the city of Carmel, Indiana that, you know, you can criticize and I criticize them f- frequently about how their auto centric roundabouts are not walkable and bikeable, but what they did do very, very well was try to control that building of a sense of place, an actual destination downtown. Right. So, um, I, I would almost say like my, my focus is almost the alternative to that. So if you, most of the people who write about suburban redesigns recommend buying up everything and having one developer, private sector, public sector, do it all at once. So you can just build out the whole thing at once and make it work. And in the cases where that works, that, that can work. It's more of a risk from the strong towns perspective. It like you exactly. know, risks yeah. insolvency, right? Yeah. But like yeah. if you go to Baldwin park in, in Orlando, other places where they've done that very well, and it's totally doable. But I think that there's only so many times we're going to do that. There's a limited ability for cities to buy up huge amounts of area and redevelop it all itself. So my focus is on how do we make a strategic investment in streets and a a single block and change regulations to create conditions in which the private sector where dozens of or hundreds of landowners will choose to redevelop it and actually achieve a, the, the common goal of creating well-defined space and pedestrian friendly buildings, which requires that, that, commitment to consistency. You can go back to that image you just pulled up there actually. So well, I'm going to come back Kendall. to I'm going to come back to 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 Kendall in just a moment here, but I want to kind of stick with what you just said there and and I'll amend kind of what I said earlier in the sense that yeah, so we're here and to to sort of, you know, 
riff off of what you were just saying is let's change the conditions. Let's change the game so that we don't, we, the city, maybe we're not going to leverage debt. Maybe we're not going to go into the hole to be able to buy up all these places, but we're going to change the conditions and the, the rules of the game so that this shit stops happening. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so for example, yeah. a land value tax, you know, if, yeah. if you yeah. are actually taxing that land based on what it could be used for given its location next to um, uh, future bus lanes, et cetera, um, you uh, suddenly it's, it doesn't make sense to just have, you know, big empty parking lots. You know, you're going to tax it in a way where um, you got to build something on those parking lots because having something that's producing zero income isn't going to cut it anymore. So things like that changes reality on the ground. So and we can have a, we can have an entire discussion all just about land value tax. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it. So this is so inside one of the suburban retrofits, which is that I looked at, which is downtown Kendall in Miami, Florida. This is one of the first retrofits ever. Very very cool. Very interesting. There's like, well, it's about halfway there right now. Parts of it are really working well and other parts less so. But there's this one really cool case study in the center of it, which is a development called Downtown Dadeland. I know this is confusing. Downtown Dadeland is inside downtown Kendall, but anyway. It's Dade, it's Dade County. So that's. Part yeah, of it's the in Dade, Dade County. Right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, whereas the uptown core. They only enclosed the main street for this like one section and the rest was kind of gaping open to parking lots and blank walls. Here, they invested in enough buildings along this one street that it completely encloses the street. And as you look down the street, at the end of the street is this beautiful building with like a, a rounded facade at the end and, and an architectural feature on top. And the whole street is, I don't know how tall it is, maybe eight-ish stories or, or something to that, but it, it feels reasonably human scale and there's commerce. Yeah, it feels very European. Yeah. Yeah. It feels very European. When this was first built, it was surrounded by parking lots on all sides and wide roads, but you wouldn't know it when you're on that street. It is, it is completely insulated from that car oriented environment around it. So I find this very inspirational. You know, when we're looking at kickstarting this new kind of growth, this is a great way to do it. Just totally enclose that one place that, that feels truly pedestrian friendly. And then that helped encourage other people to make similar investments. And now um, the entire area around it is, is slowly becoming completely um, pedestrian friendly like this and, and no longer needs yeah. to, to hide it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think... But, uh, go ah, ahead. What's that? <laughs> so this, this is what used to be there. This is the old Burger King headquarters. So uh, this, and this was surrounded by a huge parking lot. So they were up against a difficult fight when they when they first built this stuff let's see oh yeah the next image is an arrow of you so you see what i mean here that they built enough buildings to create this entire street that on the inside was was totally walkable and you see in the background uh, some of the other buildings that went up now you see in the bottom right corner that's kendall drive and the original plan was for this to be turned into like a you know a uh, one lane street in both directions with with uh, a tram and nothing like that happened so in all of these retrofits you get these these political fights and institutional fights you know this was the engineering department saying absolutely not you will not shrink the size of this street this street is for this road is for moving uh, many many cars at high speed and you know now it's uh, how many lanes is that uh, eight yeah eight lanes i mean is it a state road I think so. I have to. I, I I did have that in my thesis, but I do believe that it's a state road. And it looks like over here on the left, that's another big monster road. Is that a, an interstate or definitely a state highway over there on the that's upper the, left? That's the very first highway in American history. That is yeah. that is US See, one. There, there it you go. It goes from yeah. north to the south. Yeah, so yeah. major highway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this diagram shows the places that have been redeveloped in this one pocket next to Metro, a train going straight to downtown Miami. And some of the other spots that are going to be redeveloped soon, but just been delayed. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. Fascinating yeah, so stuff. That's, yeah. There's lots to say about downtown Kendall, but I know we're well over time. And uh, that's that's the main thing I wanted to raise about it was just the strategy of of creating one street at least that's yeah. fully enclosed. 
Yeah, because if you can get one street in and you can kind of like create a demonstration that this is not the end of the world, yeah. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> you know, you can hopefully kind of counter the uh, the conspiracy theorists uh, that are trying to debunk uh, and derail anything that, you know, smacks of walkability and 15 minute city and, and all that kind of stuff. It's just like, look, guys, it's it. I mean, it, and what's really interesting, like in the example of Miami, all you have to do is just pop over to Miami Beach and go to Espan all the way. I mean, it's just there's some delightful kind of of pockets and enclaves that you can point to and say, yeah, we're, we're not talking about, you know, trying to Manhattanize this this is what we're talking about. This is livable. This is, this is what you go to and, and visit when you're on vacation and you yeah. rave to your family yeah, and friends exactly. about, you know, yeah. afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and downtown Kendall, once that got going and people got excited about it, they, they got to work on trying to create 11 other walkable areas like that. So success can really inspire a lot more success. Yeah. What have we not talked about that you really want to leave the audience with in the context of the work that you have done to to get to this point and the and the and and these examples, these studies, as well as what you're interested in moving forward? Because I, I suspect that you've learned a lot and you're excited about uh, the direction that you all are heading in. Yeah. So the one thing I, I did mention, but I, I think we need to get to a place where we have official standards that recognize that there is a fundamental and categorical distinction between designing communities for high-speed traffic, which is very important. Logistics are important. Deliveries are important. Uh, traveling to the next city is important. You know, Industrial parks are important. We need to have these places that are actually built around machines, and we need to do that very well, and we're pretty good at it. And we need to design other places around people. And right now we have the same standard books applying in both places. And even the advocates for walkability and, and you know, the planners that, that believe in walking and biking, they push back. They don't accept there being a categorical distinction. They just want to make everything walkable everywhere. I think they're in a completely dreamy fantasy, you know, land. And it's frustrating to me because if industrial parks are not going to become you know, people-friendly, wonderful places to be. And so we need to accept that there is a categorical distinction. And if you really want to create places that are going to be truly healthy and truly human-centered and, and just wonderful to, to be outside and chat with your friends, it requires excellence. It requires not just small changes, but consistent improvements, consistent high-quality building design, consistent street design. And uh, so that's, that's what we're working on, on creating this designation to empower local governments across Canada to say that there are certain areas of their communities that they want to be, you know, not a little bit more walkable, but truly walkable, truly human friendly places. So that's, that's a big thing for me. The other thing is that, you know, my professional and life goal now is to help cities across Canada, the United States and the world transform suburban areas into walkable places. I don't want this to be academic work that sits on the shelf. I want to be out there uh, working with communities on, on kickstarting that growth. And um, so if you're listening to this and you want to make that happen in your community, let's, let's talk because uh, yeah, I want to take this to a massive scale. Yeah. And we're flipping through some images right here on the landing page uh, to, to the website as well. And I, I want to say that, you know, that's one of the most difficult things that you could try to tackle is to try to tackle suburban that suburban context and try to change it exactly it is hard yeah and that's actually what attracts me to it because lots of people are experts at like helping make vibrant downtowns a little bit more vibrant like that's doable that's much easier the the task that fascinates me is taking the absolute hardest places to do this and succeeding there because the ma vast majority of urban area in north america is these unwalkable car centric places. And so we can't achieve any of our goals on health or sustainability or anything else unless we can change these places at scale. And I'm going to say that the magic to that is to really embrace the bicycle. Yeah. Because the distances, the densities aren't there 
to right. be able to support true transit. Mm-hmm. And the distances are too great to support true walkability. And so yeah. the the bicycle, the lowly <laughs> bicycle that predated the automobile, reminder folks, you know, that was Just that barely. was the, they were about the, that same was the time, vehicle. No, it it was around about a hundred years prior to, I mean, the original bikes, the the original bikes, the original bikes, safety bike. Yeah, exactly. And, and and so we really do see that we can actually uh, transform many of these suburban contexts into bikeable distances, bikeable communities. And uh, there's some really great examples of, uh, especially in like in Olu, Finland, which is a very suburban context development, but they have an entire network of off street pathways and bikeways that connect to all the cul-de-sacs so that the kids can get to school, can the, the you know, everybody can get to work and everything. And so you see something like ridiculous numbers of kids getting riding bikes to school, like 60, 70 percent of the kids. Wow. Um, we're talking Dutch level bike ridership across all ages and abilities because of a separation of a network of walking and biking paths uh, that are not part of the roadway network. Um, so it is possible. I've even lived one in, in, a, faci- in a, a community like that in Orange County, California, back in the early 1990s, where we have this network of off street mm. pathways so that you could get to parks, you could get to the shopping, you could get to the schools. Um, so this is possible to retrofit. Um, but we do need to kind of shift things around and we need to transform the on-road facilities too to be less deadly because right now they're just absolutely deadly. Yeah. Bicycles are like a force multiplier for walkable contexts. And when there are big gaps between them it, and between homes and these walkable places, it, it allows more people to get to them. And like you just said, the big challenge in the American and Canadian context is the um, how to get those bike lanes across those eight lane roads. Yes. Yeah. And in the case of like Boulder, Colorado, the way that they've handled that is they have built nearly 100 underpasses. So the, right. the bikes, the bicycle network actually seamlessly, you know, goes right underneath the uh, motor vehicle network. Um, their biggest challenge is where they're not able to do those is having those difficult battles that take place to try to transform the street space into more right. walkable, bikeable places. So yeah. fascinating. Well, yeah. I got to hand it to you, man. You're, you're taking on a lot going after trying to transform those environments. You're absolutely right. Uh, for the, the, the old historic downtowns and the cities that have, have, you know, have the bones of an old historic core and then people move to the suburbs and then abandon the cities, those places, you know, the Kansas cities of the world, the uh, Buffalo, New York's of the world and many other, uh, Detroit is another great example that are coming around because they're able to reimagine that downtown that had been abandoned and there's plenty of infill development to happen. But you decided to make it difficult for yourself. You're going after the suburban context, which is yeah. Fast it doesn't becoming, have good bones. Has terrible it doesn't bones. have good bones. <laughs> it's fast becoming obsolete. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, you know, neighborhoods that are now 50, 60, even some 70 years old. Uh, yeah. And so we're watching them crumbling. Some of the infrastructure that we saw in some of your images, you're just like, well, not only that, that's just not attractive to anybody, not even yeah. people who prefer to live in a single family home. Those yeah. places just plain suck. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, yeah. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Mm, yeah, for me too. Just uh, what a wonderful conversation. Could have talked forever. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed part two of our conversation with Dr. Tristan Cleveland of the Happy Cities Organization. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts uh, here on the Active Towns channel. You can become an Active Towns ambassador uh, by joining my Patreon. Uh, which, by the way, if you're part of Patreon, you're able to gain access to all this content early and ad-free, which is 
super cool bonus, as well as you get 15% uh, off of all items in the Active Town store, which is another way that you can support my efforts. And you can also make a donation to the nonprofit. All of that is available from the website at activetowns.org. Thank you all so much. It really means a lot to me to have you tune in. And uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>